there we go. Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Sarah Khalifa and I am a member of the Amazing Women in Learning Alicia program that's hosting tonight's event. Um, I believe this is a first for Will and I think I wanna see a first, the first faculty book panel at U of M Dearborn. Um, but hopefully not the last. Uh, so this event is meant to take a deep dive into the research of uh, UMD's esteemed faculty and they'll share uh, details of their work and their published books. Um, I'm gonna start tonight with some shameless um, advertising of WILL. So the Women Learning Leadership or WILL is a program devoted to fostering, developing and supporting collegiate women's leadership. And it's founded on these three principles. Uh, if anyone is interested in more information, um, we'll paste the Link to our site in the chat. And if you're interested in joining them, please contact Hanya Khan, who is the chair of Will, as well as Dr. Anna Mueller, who's the head of the program, um, and we'll post both their emails in the chat. So on to our event. So I'd like to mention that if anyone has questions during the presentations, please just throw them in the chat and we'll read them out um, at the end and give the panelists some time to answer. But just so we have uh, a clear run through of panelist after panelist. Um, so the first panelist that I have the honor of introducing is Dr. Francine Banner. Dr. Banner is an associate professor in sociology. Let me click there, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Banner is an associate professor um, in sociology who also teaches in criminology and criminal justice and women's and gender studies. Her research focuses on gender, law, and conflict in many forms. You can see her bio here for more information about her. But um, I'd like to read one of these testimonies here from students who have had or worked with Dr. Banner. Um, as you can see, there's a lot here and there was actually more as well, but I'm afraid I can only fit so much onto one slide. Uh, so as one student says, Dr. Banner has a warm and engaging journey that really helped keep both together. Her work on sexual assault on her class on family violence revolves around sen sensitive, hard to hear topics, but she handles them with empathy and understanding that encourages us all to listen. And she's here to talk to us about her book, Crowdsourcing the Law, Trying Sexual Assault on Social Media. So I'll pass it over to her. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, Sarah and all of Will and um, Dr. Mueller for having us. This is amazing. And um, I am really, really honored to be uh, kicking off the fantastic Dr. B panel. Um, so I don't have any PowerPoint. I don't know. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> um, so um, I, uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about, the book does concern sexual assault. So feel free to mute me or tune me out um, as needed if um, I'm not going to really address anything that's particularly graphic. Um, but the topic in general, I know, is a sensitive one. Um, if I can put in a shameless plug, I have a new class I'm going to be teaching uh, in fall, Sexuality, Gender, and the Law. It's going to be online. Uh, and if some of you are still around in the fall and haven't graduated, I would love to see you in class. Um, also planning to teach law and culture and family violence. And uh, if all goes well and we're back in person, hopefully the family violence class will be an in-person class, which I'm really excited about. Um, so um, I wasn't quite sure exactly how to prepare and I assumed most people wouldn't have uh, read the book, but shameless plug, um, I got to pick the cover and I'm really happy with it. And I think it's kind of pretty. Um, and the library has it and they have an e-version. So um, should you want to read it, um, you can definitely check it out through the Mardigian site. Um, the book uh, came from a place uh, that uh, was adjacent to, but maybe not directly connected to my research. So as Sarah mentioned, I study gender law and conflict. In addition to having my PhD, I still keep up my law license. Um, and a lot of the work I do is around um, sexual assault in institutional contexts. So I look a lot at um, sexual assault in the military and work with an organization called the Center for Law and Military Policy that works around advocacy for survivors um, to try to get them access to the courts. And I'm also part of a research team with Dr. Aronson, Dr. Linker, and Dr. Martin on campus that's looking at uh, issues of sexual assault and harassment at University of Michigan and in general really focusing on um, what we call ambient harassment or um, what some people might call, um, which I think is an unfortunate title, yellow zone harassment, that type of harassment that is embedded in the everyday context, um, jokes or photographs or comments about people's bodies. 
um, that contribute to a rape culture, but may not be reported um, or may not be acknowledged by a lot of different people. Um, as I do this work uh, that is, I think, more policy-based, I read a lot and I read a lot of blogs and I'm, uh, I love pop culture. So I'm always on sites like Slate or Medium or Delisted um, and all of those celebrity blogs. Hi, Penny. <laughs> I see. <you. laughs> Hi, Maria. Hi, everybody. Um, so as I'm reading these, um, as I'm reading these blogs, I really became interested in the ways in which people were talking about law and the ways in which they had certain expectations of people who would bring accusations and expectations of what alleged uh, perpetrators would do if they were accused of sexual assault. Um, so as I approached the project, I had two topics um, that I wanted to talk about overall. One was what were people saying? Um, and in particular, what were people saying about women? Because the internet is not often a kind place um, in talking about women, it can be very exclusionary. Um, and then also, how is what people were saying changing law and the legal environment? Um, so the book is loosely organized around a lot of high profile cases that many people might recognize, the Brock Turner case, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, and each chapter takes those cases to talk about particular topics. So how might people talk about accusers? How would people talk about alleged perpetrators? And then um, what are some of the differences that we might see in how law is operating with the advent of all of this access to social media? Um, so in general, just a couple observations that I'd like to share from the, the book process is that um, people are not passive consumers of law and media. People are active crime solvers um, and they're engaged and powerful. So um, if we think about our own lives, um, if we're watching television, we might have network shows like CSI or Law and Order back in the day. Today, we've got podcasts, thousands of them devoted to true crime. We've got all kinds of documentaries like Making a Murderer. And then we have access to all kinds of online petitions through organizations like change.org. And so if you take, for example, um, the case of Brock Turner, when uh, the narrative of the victim impact statement became publicized in the Brock Turner case, the public was able to mobilize around that. They had access to the statement. Then they can go on change.org, sign petitions for recusal of the judge in that case. Um, and then ultimately a referendum was passed in California removing the judge that had initially sentenced Brock Turner. Um, and I kind of talk about that as something unique that, that this social media today gives people a power to influence law in a much more direct and impactful way than they might have before. Um, some other things I noticed, um, people love to use legal language. And so I was surprised how much law I found, um, even in comment sections that people might ordinarily discard um, as you know, not particularly interesting or insightful. Um, so people throw around a lot of terms like due process and evidence and fact finding. Um, but the issue on social media is that in fact, there is no sensor on what sorts of things get used as evidence. So um, people can throw out whatever they would want in social media where in a courtroom, um, there would be a judge weighing whether or not that evidence was going to be um, prejudicial to the defendant or whether that evidence was going to be harmful to the victim in a case. And so on social media, um, it's very much like what a courtroom might look like if there were no, no procedural rules. Um, one thing I noticed is that people talk about accusers very differently depending on who they are talking about and what kinds of claims the person is making. Um, so um, race certainly plays into that. Um, gender, age, um, all sorts of things would play into impressions. So I, I compare and contrast, for example, um, the accusers of Larry Nassar in connection with the mass abuses at Michigan State um, to the ways in which people talked about the accusers of Bill Cosby um, for whom a lot of time had passed and many of whom um, were older and um, famous in their own right. Um, and I noticed when people talked about the Nasser accusers, they tended to use the word survivor a lot. 
um, which carries with it a particular meaning. Um, it, when they talked about Cosby, most often they would use the term accuser. Um, and the ways in which then they had different expectations of the individuals would become clear. So with the Cosby case, they would talk a lot about time to reporting. Why didn't they report sooner? Um, and they would talk about um, those types of issues where when they talked about Nasser's uh, accusers, they would much more talk about um, bravery and how brave they were in coming forward and how we need to support these women um, eventually. Um, and I also talk about um, how if it's one person, often one woman's word is doubted. The Me Too, after the Me Too movement, we see more and more people coming forward and the needle starts to shift in how people talk about these things. Um, another thing I talk about is, is the idea of rape myths um, and the ways in which um, people on social media were positively very aware um, of ideas of harms of uh, concepts like victim blaming. And so um, I noticed that people often would say, well, um, I don't want to participate in victim blaming here. Um, and they would forthrightly state, well, we don't want to blame um, a person for accepting a, a drink, or we won't blame a person for going home with someone at night. So people voiced a large awareness around concepts like rape culture and victim blaming. Um, on the other hand, um, I argue that rape myths are becoming embedded in different ways. So they might not talk about um, what someone wore, um, but one of the things I noticed people talked about a lot was, did somebody bring a civil suit? Um, in, in addition to or instead of criminal charges. Um, and I argue that um, we don't see rape myths perhaps as overtly, but in talking about did someone bring a civil suit, um, were they trying to seek some kind of payout from bringing a claim, um, talking about false claims, that these are new ways of uh, uh, blaming the victim that may be more subtle. Um, and I also talk about then also um, how, how this impacts alleged perpetrators. Um, so um, while we have the expectation that um, victims are gonna come forward immediately, that they're gonna report promptly, um, that they're going to be um, very, uh, they're gonna be interested in the public good and only file criminal charges and never seek a personal reward after having experienced a harm. Um, we also have the expectation that alleged perpetrators, if they're falsely accused, are gonna do certain things. So um, the idea that someone who is accused is gonna bring a defamation suit um, is often out there. People often talk about law as a game. Um, you know, this person caught a case and now they need to deal with it. Um, so on both sides, there's this idea that law can be manipulated in some way um, by either the person bringing um, charges or by the person who's facing charges. Um, so in general, people talk about law a lot, but the impression they have is that law is a lot more flexible. Um, than it really is in such cases, um, because in reality, um, we know it's very difficult to um, bring charges in a sexual assault case. It is very painful and strenuous on the person who's bringing the accusations. Um, and most criminal cases don't ultimately make it to trial. Um, most criminal cases um, ultimately either are pled out or um, they may not be, they may be abandoned at some point during the process because it is such an onerous process to, uh, to go through. Um, but in, in social media, um, people generally tend to think the process is a lot simpler and a lot more up for grabs. Um, so that's just one aspect of some things that I talk about in the book. I know we only had 10 minutes, so I'm gonna stop here and let other people chime in. Um, on their research, because I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say. Thank you, Dr. Vanner. <laughs> um, well, that was amazing. And uh, thank you for giving us a glimpse into your work. I know it's becoming a lot more important, especially as social media platforms are growing and you have them impacting so many aspects of our lives. Um, let me share my screen first.
Um, so our next panelist is uh, Dr. Maya Barak. Uh, she is, Dr. Barak is an assistant professor of criminology and criminal justice and affiliate of women's and gender studies at the University of Michigan-Dearborn. Her research brings together the areas of law, deviance, immigration, and power, utilizing interdisciplinary approaches that span the fields of criminology, law and society, and anthropology. She's here to present her book, Capital Defense, Inside the Lives of American Death Penalty Lawyers. She's also authoring her second book, Is Immigration Court Unfair? Procedural Justice, Deportation, and Immigrant Legal Consciousness under contract with NYU Press. Um, one student says about Dr. Barak is that she's been very supportive of the Criminology and Criminal Justice Collective. She's also quick to give advice, step in, and offer any help when asked. She has been personally a great mentor and has taught me a lot of things in terms of reaching out for service projects, communication with the C CJ department, and becoming a more adept leader. Here is Dr. Barat to introduce us to her amazing work. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's here on a Friday evening during dinner. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to see all these, these faces and also just images and, and phone numbers and however it is that you're here uh, this evening. Um, so I do have a couple little slides. Um, I wanted to highlight sort of the focus of the book. One of the questions that we were asked to talk about uh, this evening was sort of what drove us to do this research. So this book, Capital Defense, Inside the Lives of America's Death Penalty Lawyers, um, it sits, I would say it sits kind of at the intersection of criminology and criminal justice and legal sociology, right? Because we're interested, my co-author and I were interested in the lives and work of capital defense attorneys. So attorneys who primarily represent capital clients, clients who are facing the possibility of execution. Um, and while we know a lot about capital punishment in general, right, well, there's been a lot of research on capital punishment, there's been less attention to the role that attorneys play in the capital process and also the impacts of this work um, on the attorneys themselves. And so we had some special attention um, in the book to questions of identity around issues of gender, around issues of race, around issues of um, the, the attorney client relationship. Um, but in particular, we were interested and sort of motivated to do this work um, to learn more about the generally detrimental effects of this work on the people um, who practice capital defense and not just them, but on the other people in the system right, who come in contact with capital punishment. So everyone from victims, offenders, prosecutors, judges, juries, mitigation specialists, anyone who works on these cases. Uh, and so I wanted to actually highlight some of the voices of our participants. So we did interviews with 65 capital defense attorneys from across the country. Um, and one of the focuses, again, in this book was the painful realities of capital work. And so I thought, what better way to share the research than to voice the words of those we learned from. Okay, so the case details can be searing. And as Kevin mentioned, difficult to forget even years after a case is over. As he recalled, the facts were about as horrible as a case could be. And I'm fresh out of law school and I'm looking at the crime scene pictures and it's like nothing I've ever seen before. The first time you see it, you kind of want to throw up. You can't believe that a human body could be like this. And it was so bad. It was so horrible. I remember how it was when I first saw the picture of that child. But I've seen so many different crime scene pictures, really, really graphic ones. I have this Rolodex in my head of these different pictures. And sometimes a specific restaurant where a crime happened, like a pizza place or a 7-Eleven or tons of other little things in life will remind me of a crime scene photo. And we heard remarks like this time and again from the attorneys we spoke with. Um, they really could not shake the effects of these cases. Um, some of them were more aware of these effects. Some of them were not. Um, more than one attorney that we spoke with said that the interview process itself was somewhat therapeutic because they hadn't been in a situation where they needed to explicitly confront the work that they were doing and the traumatic effects um, capital punishment can have on the attorneys. In particular, those who had worked with clients that had been executed. So I am gonna read um, one attorney's recollection of a client's execution, which, um, is a little, to say the least, a, a little bit traumatic. So just a heads up. 
Um, Perhaps most difficult is having to explain to a client that the courts have denied his final appeals and that the execution will proceed as scheduled. For Mike, this happened following around the clock appeals to the US Supreme Court. Once the court lifted its stay of execution, Mike was left to convey the news to his client. As he recalled the story, he was overcome with emotion. He was the first client I had executed more than 20 years ago. He was mentally retarded, Mike explained, emphasizing the numerous ways the legal team had argued against the execution. He described a zealous investigation that went back more than a half century and defense team even compiling affidavits from the client's former special education teachers. Everybody loved the defendant, Mike said. Even the prison warden had trouble with this case. I mean, it was tough. Mike's voice began to break as he described his final conversation with his client. So I get a call. The court has lifted the stay. I'm going to give you 15 minutes before I tell anyone else. So I get the client on the phone and I said, the Supreme Court has denied your stay of execution. They've lifted it. Most clients would know what that means. But he says, well, what about my writ of certiorari? He couldn't even pronounce it correctly. And I said, well, that was it. I mean, most people of normal intellect, even if they understood that the execution would now proceed, would still have trouble understanding how the case went from the lowest federal court to the highest federal court in 48 hours, that you win, you win, you win, you win, and all of a sudden you lose at the very last step. Mike continued in a soft voice. I tried to say it by implication. And finally, I just had to say, your case is over. They're going to kill you. It was at this point that Mike took a long pause. He let out a gasp and the words that followed were muddled by soft crying. And I can't help. He became silent then managed to blurt out. And my client said, well, they're here, goodbye. In a shaky voice, Mike continued. And then the very next day, I had to be in court on a different case. He paused and just get up and go and do it. Um, and again, these words were not unique to this participant. Um, so one of the I think some of the most important insights that we take away from this book are why it is that capital defense attorneys would want to work in this area of law and specialize working with capital clients who in most cases are, are factually or legally guilty of the crimes with which they're being charged and in most cases are going to be found guilty. Um, these attorneys consider it their job to prevent execution. A win for these attorneys is a plea bargain. It's life in prison without the possibility of parole. Um, and along the way, they're confronting issues of their own identity, their client's identity, racial injustices in the criminal justice system, um, dealing with the media, dealing with being in the position of acknowledging the pain of victims and their families, trying to work with them, make a space for them so that they have a say in the process as well, um, but trying to prevent the state from killing their clients. Um, so why did they do this work? Most of them feel that it's a calling, despite all the pain and trauma that they're exposed to and the secondary um, trauma, vicarious trauma that they live with. Um, and when I say live with, some of them die with it. That we heard stories of <laughs> capital defense attorneys having heart attacks at, you know, at, in their 40s um, while they were in the middle of an argument in court and not wanting to leave until they finished. Um, so why do they do this? Because they believe in abolition and they want to work to prevent these executions for their clients. Um, and so they find a sense of purpose in, in knowing that they're contributing to the cause. And with that, I will pass it along. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brock, for that, um, for that insight. I, I always imagine the lawyer's job was not easy, but I'm sure when you're talking about death penalty lawyers, it's just a completely different world. Um, so thank you for that. It's definitely, I'm sure it was not easy to write. Um, so up next we have uh, Dr. Suzanne Bergeron who will be presenting her book. Sorry, my computer seems to be glitching, but we'll be presenting her book, uh, Liberating Economics, Feminist Perspectives on Families, Work and Globalization, the second edition. Dr. Bergeron is the Helen M. Graves Collegiate Professor of Women's, and Women's Studies and Social Sciences. She teaches courses on sex, gender, and the body in development, gender globalization, economic development, feminist theory, introduction to women's and gender studies, and history of economic thought. 
Her current research traces out the implications of using efficiency arguments to achieve gender equity goals in various areas of development policy and examines the possibilities of fostering community and solidarity economics in neoliberal times. As a will member says, as a will member says, Dr. Vergeron has always been passionate about Will as one of the founding professors. With her guidance and drive in the early stages of building the organization, Will has continued to thrive and will for years to come. So thank you for helping start this amazing organization. And I'm here to I'm excited to hear about your research, Dr. Bergeron. So take it away if you please. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thank you to Will for organizing this and for uh, Dr. Mueller for, Mueller for not giving me the nudge to participate and everyone for coming out on a Friday night. So uh, like, um, I'm really honored to be on this panel with these terrific feminist researchers, the Dr. Bees. I have actually read uh, Professor Banner's book and I read Professor Brainer's book and I saw Professor Barrick's book in when she was presenting some early ideas and uh, I'm looking forward to reading that. So I feel very, very lucky to work with such terrific scholars, not just these three, but all of the Women's and Gender Studies program. And what you're seeing here in terms of the quality of the research is really emblematic of, of our entire program. And that's why all the cool people are in Women's and Gender Studies. <laughs> anyway, my book, Liberating Economics, Feminist Perspectives on Families, Work and Globalization, it's not, it's not a research monograph, rather it's an introduction to and an overview of the key insights of feminist economics. Um, it is written in an accessible style for a non-specialist audience. And it's written for non-specialist audiences like students from all fields, citizens who wanna understand the economy more fully, activists and policymakers. The goal of the book is to help people think about economics differently and to take that knowledge into action for more gender equitable economic futures. And in terms of my motivation for um, you know, writing this book, it, you know, I was motivated to join the team, to join um, the two co-authors to work on the second edition because I've actually been doing the work on thinking about economics differently for equitable economic futures since I was about 20 years old and I worked at the Center for Popular Economics and I um, got a work study job working for a professor on a, on a book trying to um, like present an alternative economics framework. So students out there, that incredible work study job you have could someday turn you into a professor <laughs> doing that thing. So the book's co-authored with these uh, two fabulous feminist economists, Drusilla Barker and Susan Feiner. And they're actually both founders of the International Association for Feminist Economics. And they were both mentors to me in earlier stages of my career. Drew and Susan had written the first edition of the book back in the early aughts. And when they decided to come up with a second edition to kind of include uh, more re recent research and data, along with an expanded focus on global South gender issues, they, I was an obvious choice. They invited me on board. But what started out as a plan to do some light revising and adding two new chapters on global issues eventually turned into a wholesale rewriting of the volume, including five new chapters. So unlike many second editions, this is a very different book than the first one. At its core, I, I guess I would say that the book makes the case that feminist approaches can liberate economics from its current wrongheaded preoccupations with self-interest, market production, profitability, and growth. Thus, rational economic man, that cornerstone of mainstream economics, who is assumed to make these kind of atomized decisions to maximize his own well-being, is replaced in our book by a socially situated individual whose decisions and agency are shaped by social context and constraints, including gender, race, class, sexuality, and colonial power dynamics. The book also challenges the sort of narrow, um, excuse me, the narrow focus of mainstream economics on market production as it ignores the enormous amount of essential goods and services being produced in households. 
and communities outside of the market, including unpaid care work, the majority of which, as many of you know, is done by women. The book also shows why it's important to reject the mainstream fetishization of growth as a key indicator of economic well being. There is an embedded assumption in economics that growth benefits ev everyone, a rising tide lifting all boats, which empirical evidence and likely your own personal experience does not confirm. <laughs> Further, an emphasis on growth as a sine qua non of the economy fails to consider the ways that our voracious use of natural resources is destroying environments and, uh, and communities. So I also want to note that feminists are not the only ones providing these critiques. And in the book, we acknowledge that we're just adding to a growing chorus of non-mainstream economists and social movements working to similarly liberate economics by centering goals of shared well-being, equity, security, and sustainability over growth and profits. So um, because the potential scope of feminist economics is enormous, our book actually focuses on topic areas where the economic consequences of gender divisions of labor have a particular salience. Um, so after the introduction, our chapter two, Family Matters, examines the history of the male breadwinner, female homemaker model of the household. A very, uh, by the way, recent history, unlike some of my students who will always start a paper about it saying, since the dawn of time, you know, um, men brought home the mastodon and women cooked it. Well, that, that actually isn't true. That uh, male breadwinner, female homemaker model really only dates back to the transition from feudalism to capitalism in Europe. Um, anyway, so it looks at that history, it looks at the economic and social effects of that model, and it also examines the ways that standard economic theories take this model and its division of labor is given. And we also show that this model is being challenged by changing gender roles and a growing diversity of family forms and household arrangements, including queer households. And Professor Brainer knows that I would never write anything about the economics of the family without bringing in a critique of its relentless heteronormativity and um, paying attention to queer households. Chapter three, uh, Love's Labor Cares Cost, actually builds on chapter two to analyze caring labor. And while care work performed in households is at odds with mainstream economics views of what counts as work because it's unpaid, the emotional aspect of care work is also something that sets it apart. So we talk about that. Thus, even care work that's performed in the paid labor force is understood and valued differently than other kinds of occupations, we argue. And in the chapter, we, we kind of trace out um, a number of ways uh, a number of debates about care work and economics, and we talk a lot about the devaluation of paid care, which we argue contributes to both labor injustice, as well as a shortage of the kind of work that is so crucial to the well being of individuals and society. Now, and now I want to make a brief aside. We actually finished this book in February 2020 before the pandemic hit. But the analysis we provide in this chapter three, I think illuminates why the incredible strain that families and especially women experience occurred when they're already patchy and largely privatized solutions to uh, care disappeared overnight in the early days of the pandemic. And I, I'm I think I'm talking to a lot of you when I describe this because many people in this room tonight I know went through that. Um, the, the, the kind of uh, incredible strain that, that occurred when suddenly the kids and the parents that you're taking care of are at home and you can bring in care workers, you don't have daycare. The chapter also illuminates the precarities that women, particularly poor women of color face doing frontline work associated with care. And so I, we feel that the pandemic exposed what our book would argue is the hidden truths of the economy that the essential work that contributes the most to our individual and social well-being is paradoxically among the least respected and lowest paid. And the pandemic folks may well be the wake up call that our society needs to shift its economic values when it comes to paid care work. And let's hope so. Um, we are, I will just say, we are seeing some movements in that direction of supporting unpaid care work in Washington, DC, 
right now some of these policies and it uh, it's that's no surprise to me because there are a couple of feminist economists on the Council of Economic Advisors. <laughs> so anyway, moving on to talk a little bit about the rest of the book. The next chapter addresses gender work and policy in the United States with a focus on the gender wage gap, which uh, is a top interesting topic for this week. Um, Chapter five examines the relationship between gender and poverty in the United States with core attention to the ways that gender intersects with other uh, forms of power. We then turn our lens to the global stage with a chapter on the uneven impacts of globalization on human well being. And then uh, um, another chapter that provides a close up on women in the labor force in the global south. What follows that is a chapter on gender and development policy, and then a chapter on debt, um, which concludes with a call for debt forgiveness, which some of you who are graduates might appreciate, because I know we have some alumni in the room. The concluding chapter entitled Feminist Economic Futures engages some of the ideas of the book with uh, contemporary efforts to, um, to create social change. Um, and here we kind of focus on how we can create a world with a more egalitarian division of labor, a more egalitarian distribution of income, a world characterized by decent work and ample time and sustainability. So as you can see, this is a very narrow, small and focused treatment of the topic, ha ha. Now, what, what we're trying to do is provide a very broad overview meant to invite readers into feminist economics and inspire them to join in efforts towards equitable economic futures. And I, I hope that the book, chapters of which I've assigned in some of my classes, so some of you have read these chapters, and the, and the book also will be available as a, a free ebook in the library uh, in a couple of weeks. So I hope the book will inspire some of the students that are here tonight, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Bergeron. Um, for that insight into uh, feminist economics and the perspectives. Um, and also thank you for making the book um, something that even students can understand because I know being a minor woman's in gender studies is a lot of work out there that's kind of difficult to understand when you're not a PhD. So making it accessible is definitely a plus for everyone. Um, so our final panelist of the night, I'm gonna share my screen again, um, is Dr. Amy Brainer, um, who's Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Coordinator of the LGBTQ Plus Studies at the University of Michigan-Dearborn. She's excited to share her book, que Queer Kinship and Family Change in Taiwan. She is currently writing a new book tentatively titled In Bed with the State, Queer Migrations Through Marriage. Um, all these topics are close to her own life and heart. Dr. B welcomes questions about her work and also about her identity and ethics as a researcher. So from one student, Dr. Brainer is one of the greatest professors of U of M Dearborn. She's down to earth, charismatic, empathetic, and sweet. She truly cares about the success and well-being of all of her students. She emphasizes including a diverse curriculum that allows students to learn about many different perspectives, both nationally and internationally. So presenting her work today is Dr. Brainer. Thank you. Um, so going last, my goal is to be short. Um, I know concentrating on Zoom is even harder than concentrating in person, at least it is for me. Um, so I time myself and this is eight minutes. Um, and I'm gonna answer two questions. One is, why did I want to do this research? And what is one thing that I found? And that was hard to choose, um, but I think of it like a movie trailer. So you get one scene and if you want to know more, please just let me know and I'll send you a PDF of the book. I'm happy to do that. Okay, so why did I wanna do this research? Um, to answer this question, I need to tell you a little bit about me. I grew up in a very close knit family, still very close knit. And I came out to them when I was in college. Um, and at that time, my family home was in mainland China and I was in college in the United States. My coming out was met with um, a tremendous amount of pain, particularly for my mother. Um, and I realized at the time and more so later that my sister was doing a ton of emotional labor to take care of her um, and also to support me. 
So on a personal level, um, the level of my spirit, I wanted to understand where is this pain coming from? You know, what is going on for my mother, my sister, my brothers? Um, and this was about 20 years ago. And in the US at that time, there was not a lot of compassion um, in either directions. So the model that I saw publicly was of people leaving their families or being pushed out of their families um, because they were gay or trans. And that was just unthinkable to me. Um, I felt like there has got to be another way. Everything I read um, seemed to be steeped in a sort of individualist North American culture. And that was out of step with my experience. And it was also out of step with the context of China, which was my reference point at the time, because that's where my family was. Um, so fast forward a few years, I finished undergrad, I started graduate school, um, and I continued looking for other narratives, alternative narratives of sexuality and family. And at that time, um, Taiwan had started the first group for parents of LGBTQ children in Asia. And I felt that was an important perspective to get. Um, if we're really going to understand what is going on, you know, for parents with families, not just white parents, not just families in the United States, a comprehensive analysis cannot leave out a majority of the world, right? So I did an ethnographic study what that means is I immersed myself um, in the community that I wanted to learn from and about. So I attended those meetings with parents of LGBTQ children for about a year and a half. Um, I volunteered with an organization that supports LGBTQ elders in Taiwan. Um, I spent time with people and families in their homes and I did life history interviews with queer and trans people and with their parents and with their siblings. So what is one thing that I found? Um, part of this story is a generational shift in how people experience um, sexuality in the context of their families. Not an age difference necessarily, but a generational difference between queer elders, and queer young people who are growing up in these really different environments, family environments. So one example of this is the way that people experience silence about sexuality. A lot of families have kind of a don't ask, don't tell policy. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. Maybe it's going on in your family right now, right? The people kind of know somebody is queer, but it's not said verbally. Um, and this was true for queer elders and queer youth, but the interpretation of the silence differed a lot. So queer elders tended to see it as supportive. Um, they're not forcing me to talk about this. That's an act of support or solidarity. Um, queer young people tended to feel silence as a burden or as kind of a disconnect, like they don't know me right? They don't acknowledge me. So what changed? Um, on the surface, we might think, oh, it's sexual identity, right? Like the younger people have stronger sexual identities that are more important to them. But that is not what I found at all. Um, actually, some of the queer elders had very strong identities, including very political identities. Um, many of them had come of age during um, pro-democracy movements in Taiwan, and they were very committed to creating social change. Some of the queer youth had strong identities too, and some didn't. Um, in both cohorts, there were people who were in same-sex relationships but didn't really um, describe them or define them in any particular way or get an identity based on that. Um, but regardless, the young people felt like they needed to come out to their families. So what was going on with that? And what I talk about in the book sort of in a longer way um, is that I think the shift is less about identity and it's more about changes and how people think about the family, about family norms, about 
um, what we want from our relationships with our family members. Um, what does it mean to be close if that's something that you want? Is being close, being um, taking care of each other materially, or is it telling each other things about yourself and your life? Um, how much information should parents have about what their children are thinking or what their children are feeling? And we have really seen a shift in Taiwan, also globally, um, toward a more intensive parenting style. So parents are, there's this expectation, parents, especially mothers, are supposed to collect tons of information about their kids, all of their characteristics, and use that to sort of curate their lives, create a certain life path for them. Um, so for younger queers, coming out became kind of inevitable. Um, their parents were monitoring them very closely. They were really likely to figure it out um, and ask them directly about their sexual orientation. And those conversations mattered to people. They felt like a significant turning point in the relationship. It's not that queer elders handled those conversations differently, it's that they never happened in the first place. Um, the closeness of the relationship was not shaped by that act of disclosure. Um, there were other things, different things, that determined the closeness and the quality of the relationships. And I write about those, of course, too, in the book. Okay, so I'm at my eight minutes. Um, thank you for sticking with us. If you are still here, <laughs> I admire you um, for being on Zoom all this time. And I really thank Will for putting this together. Um, and I'll pass the mic uh, back to Will. Thank you, Dr. Rayner. Um, and thank you for being so strict about the time. It was very sweet that you cared. Um, and also hearing that personal connection that you shared with the book um, is definitely gonna make people view it differently and definitely had me viewing it differently. Um, so uh, I'm gonna open the floor up to questions and I was actually hoping to ask the first one if everyone didn't mind, but I know that Dr. Bergeron mentioned this um, when she was talking about uh, assigning chapters in her class, but I was wondering, um, just as it's more of a general question to the panelists, how much do you incorporate your research and your uh, work into your classes in terms of assigning chapters or just focusing you know, discussion posts? Um, so whoever would like to answer can go ahead first. Um, I guess I'll go, I haven't done it very much <laughs> and maybe I should do it more. I think there's part of me that feels like when professors assign their own work that students are kind of like, mm, you know, <laughs> like, oh, you think your work is so special. Um, so I think that there's been something in me that has been a little bit resistant to assigning my own work. Uh, but I would love to talk about my work with students. I mean, I just get so excited being able to talk about my work. Um, and I will say that like the book I'm working on now, there are articles that I assign in my class that I'm now citing in my book. And so there is this connection where it's like, you know, we're having a conversation in class about something and I'm also having a conversation about it in my writing. Um, and if you go and look um, in the physical book or I guess it's in the PDF too at my acknowledgements, I actually thank students, undergraduate students at UM Dearborn for just creating that intellectual environment that I felt really kept my mind stimulated. And so I do value the classroom as being part of the, my intellectual work that has been connected to my research. Can I weigh in? This is the first time I've ever done it. So like you, like you Amy, I just, I always thought, oh, <laughs> I don't know. But, but just to also just like Amy, I will, I will say, I think that chapter um, seven of this book on um, the gender in the global labor market, it just completely comes out of the conversations I've had with students in the classroom. I, I owe such an incredible debt to my students for helping me to, to like think about these questions more richly. So thank you. <laughs> Same. Like, no, I generally don't assign 
my work in the classes, but similarly, um, I'll assign legal cases I discuss, and then a lot of the conversation we'll have around those cases and questions people have about um, contemporary issues like false claims and things like that. They all show up in the book and I, I the intellectual conversations that I have had in will and had in the classroom make their way into my work and um, listening to this, I think our work should probably make its way back in the classroom more often. So I'm going to kind of take that question to heart and think about it more. Yeah, there's an article out there showing that men are more likely than women to cite themselves, like cite their own work. And I think that's probably also true with assigning your work in class. So just something to think about. <laughs> yeah, and real real quick, because I don't want to take away time. I also don't really assign my work. I only recently started assigning some of my work, but we talk about it and I talk about it with students. And the book that I'm working on right now on immigration court, I'm really lucky to have a wonderful research assistant this semester who's helping me think through some of the ways I'm framing the book so that it is really accessible um, to students. And I, I wrote her one email, I sent her a chapter. I said, can you just look at this and let me know from a student perspective, does this feel too academic-y or is this something that resonates with you? And she kind of laughed and she said, oh yeah, it still feels pretty academic-y, um, but it is accessible. <laughs> so I think students are an important part of the conversation when it comes to my research and bringing that research back to students and so they're aware of what they're contributing is something I want to do more of. Well, I will say coming from um, a student that I love it when like professors assign their own work because just getting to read like something that's from them, I think is like the coolest thing because I'll be reading an article and I'll be like, oh, this is the, my professor. And I'll just think like, wow, they really know what they're talking about if they're writing about this. So um, I definitely think that if, if no one is doing it, then I think for sure, um, because I know that the passion comes out when you're assigning it to your students and you can really talk about it. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, they can just unmute themselves. I'm gonna check the chat. Um, but if anyone has any questions for any of the panelists, just unmute yourself and go in and ask, um, and I'll give it a second. I was just gonna say, it's true the men professors do assign their work a lot. <laughs> One professor we called Professor Ego. <laughs> Not that it wasn't appreciated, but it, it was probably more than half of the curriculum. There's a happy medium somewhere in between. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to check the chat. Um, so there is a question for Dr. Banner. Um, it says, did you find that there were certain profiles of victims or abusers that tended to be believed more, um, example, like a certain type of victim would be regularly believed, or uh, if such a trend existed, was it just throughout social media or within justice system as well? Um, well, one thing I found really interesting when I did the research was there's um, some research around um, victim impact statements. And if you're not familiar with those, um, there's an increasing trend in the courtroom, um, which I personally think is a positive trend to bring more of the impact on uh, victims of crime into the courtroom and often a victim impact statement is read as part of the trial process. And that's where um, a lot of the conversation about Brock Turner originated um, was out of the victim impact statement that was made in that case. Um, and some of the research I read around that that I found very impactful um, was that uh, non-white individuals are much less likely to make victim impact statements. Um, and that when victim impact statements from persons of color are in court, jurors are less likely to believe those. Um, so that factually there is research that exists and that's just one example um, that um, it, the tendency of the public is to underway certain statements. Um, and then in terms of social media discourse, we all know um, we're not really our real selves online. Um, and so um, one of the theorists that I use heavily in the book, um, whose work I use is Patricia Hill Collins, who's a terrific feminist legal scholar. And she talks a lot about the power of controlling images and the ways in which we talk about particular people um, becoming um, shorthand for a whole host of stereotypical ideas about those people. So one of the images I talk about, for example, is the gold digger and the ways in which that idea of a gold digger, somebody who's out for cash or out for money, 
um, is an image that connects to race and class and gender. And online, you only have, especially if you're on Twitter, you have very little time to say what you're gonna say. And so the prevalence of these controlling images and just by using one word, you can convey a whole host of things uh, about your impressions of someone um, and whether or not you believe them. So I did see those sorts of trends in the discourse that matched the scholarship. Um, I will also mention that all the um, links to the books um, are in the chat as well as uh, Dr. Barat just um, included some more information about the defense, defense initiated victim uh, outreach. Um, but if anyone has any other questions, um, let me share my screen. Um, if there are any final questions, but if not, um, I don't wanna take up any cause there's about, about two minutes left. and. Um, First, I want to thank um, the panelists for sharing their incredible work and thank everyone for attending um, before we log off for the night and enjoy our weekend. Um, there's a couple of will events that I want to bring everyone's attention to. Um, so the first is uh, next week we have our uh, um, Women's Movement panel on March 31st. This is from uh, 6 to 7.30 p.m. and this is a virtual event that's centered around taking a historical perspective to discuss the women's movement. Um, the panel is composed of experts that are gonna bring different frames of reference to discuss the progression of feminism and why, else, why it is still necessary for today's society. We'll also be discussing a lot of stereotypes around feminism and why um, and how men can help in the movement. Um, another thing we have coming up as well is a, um, uh, this is the flyer for is a blood drive that's coming up at two locations in Dearborn and Canton. So we're searching for ways to support people in our communities during these hard times. Um, the American Red Cross is testing whole blood donations for COVID-19 antibodies that can be used to help coronavirus patients in need of convalescent plasma transfusions. Um, I don't really understand the science behind it, but uh, the American Red Cross and Will are counting on everyone to help us to reach our goal of 500 blood donations um, as a commitment to help others. So there's more info on this flyer and on our Instagram as well. And finally, the Will Winter Necessities Group is gonna be partnering with Zaman, a homeless, uh, homeless shelter station in Dearborn to help gather and provide resources for those who are struggling to meet their uh, basic needs on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Zaman has various drop-off locations for those who would like to dispose of their gently used clothing or have non-perishable food items you'd like to donate. Um, there's a link that's, uh, I believe on here um, for drop-off locations, hours of operation and more information. Um, and that's it. So I want to thank everyone for coming, uh, for taking the time out of the day, and especially the panelists um, for presenting their incredible work. Thank you, everyone. Um, and we hope you all enjoy your weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks thank for you having so us. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here and Will for organizing this. And Anna too. Thanks for coming. <laughs> thank you for great talks. I really enjoy them. Thank you for everyone attending. Thank you. Good to see everybody. <laughs> Bye. This was great.